What's it like to feel humbled? Oh, that's not a word we use every day. But it's humbling when you receive a gift you didn't expect. It's humbling when someone says you don't have to pay, even though you messed up. It's humbling when your dad takes an entire day off of work just to spend it with you. It's humbling when you see an incredible sunset and realize that God handcrafted it with you in mind. Wow. Being humbled makes you feel small in a good way. It makes you feel grateful. When someone chooses to put you first like that, it can make your day. So why not do that for the people around you? You can choose to give up what you think you deserve to put others first. Let your sister pick the family movie even though it's your turn. Skip the pool party so you can hang out with your friend who broke his leg and can't go. Use some of your birthday money to help a family who doesn't have enough to eat. True humility is thinking of yourself less and others more. When you live your life with humility, you bring praise to God. You lift Him high because others can see God at work in you. That's why humility is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud. It's all about living loud. Hey, this is Jacob, or you know, just Jake. Is everyone okay? There was like an earthquake or something in my room. I didn't feel it when I was outside my room, but then when I came in the room, everything was turned upside down. My table, my bed, also known as my couch, my Ferrari, my sculpture. That's better. I don't know how this could have Wait a second. Is there such a thing as room quake? <laughs> yeah, that must be it. Anyway, I'm supposed to talk to you today about something called humility. Humility is putting others first by giving up what you think you deserve. So that means like doing stuff for others, I guess? Like my friend Chris, he's really good at humility. I mean, he humiliates me like all the time. Am I saying that right? Humiliate, humiliate, humiliate. He shows humility to me. He's super busy, but he always takes the time to put me first by playing his April Fool's surprises on me. Like the time he put my keys in Jello. 
or the time he made me a tray of brownies. <sighs> brownies. And who can forget the old and screw the top off the salt surprise? <laughs> Chris is a funny guy. Hey, you know what I think? And this is just between you and me. Chris is the one who turned all my stuff upside down. It wasn't a room quake after all. This must have taken a really long time. I mean, he turned all my stuff upside down. I do need to call my mom. This must have taken a lot of work. I'm not sure that it's fair that Chris keeps playing all these April Fool's month surprises on me and I haven't even got him once. I don't deserve this. What I deserve is to get him back. <laughs> Was that my toaster? The story today is about Jesus when he prayed in the garden while his friends couldn't even stay awake to keep watch. Jesus didn't deserve that. I wonder what he did about it. Stay tuned. I'm gonna come up with a way to turn the tables on Chris. Chris is gonna notice when he goes in his room the tables aren't the way he remembered them. I'm gonna get the revenge I deserve. I'm gonna get the revenge I deserve! Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, okay. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. And now for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 36 through 56. For months, the Jewish religious leaders had been plotting to silence Jesus. He called us pretenders, snakes! On the Sunday before Passover, Jesus entered Jerusalem to great cheers from the crowds. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! But even as the crowds swarmed in to see what Jesus would do and say, one of Jesus' closest followers, Judas, went to the religious leaders with a very sneaky plan. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? How about a cool 30 pieces of silver? Jesus knew these plans, but he also knew that his mission was to face those who hated him and let them take him without defending himself. He prepared his closest friends for this during a Passover meal and then afterwards led them out of the city toward the Mount of Olives. Judas had already left them. In a little while, you will no longer see me. Then after a little while, you will see me. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. The air cooled as the evening darkened. This very night, you will all turn away because of me. Peter, the most outspoken of Jesus' friends, quickened his step and tightened his hand on the sword he was carrying. All the others may turn away because of you, but I never will. What I'm about to tell you is true. It will happen tonight. Before the rooster crows, you will say three times that you don't know me. I may have to die with you, but I will never say I don't know you. Me too. Same. <sighs> By the time Jesus and his friends reached the Garden of Gethsemane, they were exhausted. Sit here while I go over there and pray. As the other disciples settled in on the cold, rough ground, Jesus took Peter, James, and John along with him to a grove of ancient olive trees. The weight of what was coming pressed down on him. My soul is very sad. I feel close to death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. We're here for you. We got this. Prayers. The three friends found seats among the knotted tree roots, and Jesus went on a little further. Then suddenly, he fell down on the ground, face first into the dirt. Words poured out from deep inside. My father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering away from me, but let what you want be done, not what I want. After a short time, Jesus returned to his friends. They had all fallen into restless sleep. Jesus touched Peter's arm. What? Huh? Just, uh, we're just, uh, we're just praying. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? 
watch and pray. Then you won't fall into sin when you are tempted. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. We'll stay awake this time. Got you covered. Again, Jesus threw himself down to pray. His pain was so deep, blood and sweat beaded on his forehead. My father, is it possible for this cup to be taken away? But if I must drink it, may what you want be done. Jesus returned to his friends once more to find them still sleeping. The agony in his spirit forced Jesus to lay his heart out to God once more. He prayed the desperate words again, begging God to take away what was coming, and at the same time, revealing his complete trust in God's plan. Let what you want be done, not what I want. At last, Jesus knew the time had come. He returned to find Peter, James, and John buried deep in sleep. Beyond them, his other followers slept too. Are you still sleeping and resting? The disciples struggled through a fog of sleep, blinking and yawning. Below them, torchlight showed an angry mob climbing up the hill. The men were waving swords and clubs, shouting as they came. Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is about to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Here comes the one who is handing me over to them. Jesus' friends staggered to their feet, and Peter clutched his sword. As the mob marched closer, they could see the man in front of the mob. It was their friend Judas. Judas? What are you doing? The mob had been sent by the Jewish religious leaders. Judas had already explained to them that he would greet Jesus with a kiss, so they would know exactly which man to arrest. Greetings, teacher. Judas ignored the other disciples and went directly to Jesus, kissing him on the cheek in greeting. Jesus drew back and looked Judas directly in the face. Friend, do what you came to do. The mob surged forward as the disciples just stood there, frozen and confused. As men grabbed Jesus, Peter suddenly sprang to life, awkwardly drawing his sword. Should we use our swords? Peter didn't wait for an answer, but he struck out wildly. His blade sliced right through the ear of the high priest's servant. Oh! Stop this! Jesus touched the servant's ear. Immediately, he was healed. Put your sword back in its place. Do you think I can't ask my father for help? He would send an army of more than 70,000 angels right away. But then how would the scriptures come true? They say it must happen in this way. Jesus turned back to the mob and the men who held him. They hovered there, uncertain, in the flickering light of their torches. Am I leading a band of armed men against you? Do you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courtyard teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But all this has happened so that the words of the prophets would come true. No one could respond to Jesus. Instead, they arrested him and led him away. And his friends who said they'd be with him through anything ran away. Jesus made the choice that would bring life to everyone, but that would cost him everything. Somebody's gonna get a mustard-filled donut later, and I'm finally gonna get what I deserve. <laughs> hey, did you know that Jesus didn't deserve all that stuff that happened to him? Like when his friends ditched him when he needed them, and when those people arrested Jesus even though he never did anything he wasn't supposed to? And then, when he was put on that cross, I mean, what? Jesus could like, calm a storm with his hand and bring dead people back to life. Why do you let all that bad stuff happen to him? Turns out, it was all a part of the plan. When God created the world a whole bunch of years ago, he knew people were gonna need help if they were gonna have a relationship with him. So, he told people he was sending someone who would have to pay for all the stuff they did wrong. And that someone was Jesus. But it's not like Jesus wanted to go through all that bad stuff. In the garden, he was like, God, any chance there's a different way to save the world and stuff? But then Jesus was like, it's not about what I want, God, because what you want is better. So what did Jesus do to his friends in the garden who let him down? He put them first. And what did Jesus do to those people who arrested him for no reason? He put them first. And what did Jesus do for you, me, and the whole world? He put us first. It's kind of an 
upside down way of doing things. Putting somebody else first for no reason when they don't earn it or when they may not even deserve it. I bet we could put people first like Jesus did. You know, we could let someone else pick what restaurant to go to or what video game to play. We could give up our place in line sometimes. Or when someone surprises us by turning our room upside down, we could choose to not get even. So here's the one thing I learned today. Put others first. It's not about what we deserve. It's not about what we want. What God wants is better. So April Fool's month or not, I'm gonna put people first. And Chris, if you're watching, keep the surprises coming, but I won't be taking my revenge. I'll just be sitting here getting what I truly deserve. A delicious mustard filled donut. Ah, that's some good stuff right there. That's some good mustard. See you next time.